number will just keep climbing, but I want to go ahead and get us started. So uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we're spending a lot of time with each other lately, which is a wonderful thing. I wish that we could do it in person. So hopefully we'll figure out a way to do that. Uh, and be together in person shortly. Um, so you hopefully um, know that you're at the Council on Climate Solutions meeting. Um, today we're working through um, the um, energy work group um, that has a lot of different components. So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time up front. I don't, I don't want you to um, listen to me for too long because we have a lot to do. So I'm going to keep us moving. Um, so we're going to do attendance and um, just our general um, Council business, and then I'm going to get us quickly over to um, an overview by the workgroup chairs, and we'll get into our conversation. So, with that, we're going to do attendance, and I'm going to warn Ron as I go slowly that um, we're going to do it backwards this time, or forwards if you think forward starts with a Z. So, no assumptions being made there. So, um, I'm going to start with Ron. So, Ron Vogelwe, do we have you for attendance? He's gonna be like, I always assume I don't need to be on until 305. So we'll loop back because I'm sure we'll have a few folks like that. Uh, Sam Stolper. All right. Uh, Darrell. Here. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chair Scripps. I am here, Director. Great. Phil Roos. Sorry, uh, I'm here. Good to see everybody. Great. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Cynthia Render Williams. I am present. Hey, Cynthia. Hello. Uh, Tanya Pazlowski. Here. Good afternoon. Hi, Tanya. Uh, Dean Overpack. Here, boss. Great. Boss. Ooh, I like it. Yeah. Uh, Quentin Messer or maybe Steve Bacall from MEDC. All right. Uh, Dr. Phyllis Meadows. I am here. Great. Nice to have you. We missed you last week. Um, Director Gary McDowell, or maybe I saw Joseph Rivet from MDARD. Joseph Rivet, thanks. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, Marnie Jackson. Hello, everyone. I'm present. Great, hey, Marnie. Uh, Brandon Hopmeister. I am here. Great. Um, from DHHS, Director Hertel, or I think I saw Megan Groen. I'm here. Thank you. Great. Hey, Megan. Uh, Jim Harrison. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, Treasurer Eubanks or perhaps Larry Stuckelberg? Eubanks is here. Ah, great. Uh, Director Eichinger. Present. Great to see ya. Always fall in Michigan. He's rapping. Uh, Carrie Dugan. Present. Excellent. Uh, Mary Draves. I'm here. Great. Hi, Mary. Uh, Director Corbin or Judd Herzer from Leo. Judd's here on behalf of Director Corbin. Thanks, Leo. Thank you, sir. Frank Beaver. Present and accounted for. Great. Uh, Director Ajiba or Niles from MDOT. OK, let's loop back. I think I saw Sam. Sorry, Sam, we went from Z to A, so we. No problem, sorry, I'm late. Hi, everyone. Excellent, I see Ron. Did, yep. Didn't mean to shake it up there, Ron. Thanks. Try that. Anybody else who joined us after we started a roll call that I missed? Awesome. All right, let's get into it. Um, so we're just going to do our usual business. Um, so I'd like to put the agenda in front of us and see if we have any um, discussion. So first I'll call for a motion and a second on today's agenda. So moved. I'll second. Mary Draves. Great. Thank you, Darrell and Mary. Um, any discussion on today's agenda? So it looks very similar format to what we've used in the past. Um, of course, today we're doing energy production, transmission, distribution, and storage work group. Um, so we've got a lot to discuss. Any concerns with the agenda? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, similar sign. Great, thank you. Um, so the agenda is in front of us. So let's approve or take a look at the meeting minutes from October 19th. Um, so you should have seen these yesterday. Um, sorry for the quick turnaround. Appreciate everybody's um, attention to the materials that we're moving right now. I know it's been it's been pretty fast and we're really grateful for your time and energy on this. Um, so I'll ask for a motion in a second on the October 19th minutes. So moved. 
Thanks, Joe. A second. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, any discussion, uh, improvements, um, comments on the October 19th meeting minutes? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Great. Thanks, everybody. So um, I just want to move us quickly into the overview um, by our work group co-chairs, uh, Douglas Jester and Commissioner Catherine Paratek from the Michigan Public Service Commission. Before I hand it off to them, just a couple of notes I wanted to make. Um, the first is I'm just going to remind uh, folks that are participating with us outside of council members um, that the discussion uh, for the meetings is amongst the council members. So we're thrilled that you're listening in. Um, and uh, observing and hearing the back and forth, but the discussion itself is for council members. So just want to remind you of that. Um, we do love receiving comments through the form of uh, email, through phone calls, through materials on the website, um, and we'll be doing additional listening sessions um, on draft plans and um, uh, to be announced coming up. So um, if you're looking for materials you may not have seen yet, you can check out michigan.gov slash climate um, for our previous meeting uh, materials, previous presentations, etc. And I also wanted to mention, um, we talked a little bit about this in the last session, maybe the session before. I'm just going to continue to encourage people that feel like um, the topic that we're talking about isn't the thing that they eat and breathe every day. I'm just going to encourage you to speak up anyway. We need all these perspectives and we need the perspectives of people that don't eat and drink this policy every day. We really, we need you. And so um, I'm just gonna remind council members that we're so grateful you're here. We're grateful for your expertise and wisdom. And um, please don't feel like, um, you know, just because you're not an expert in whichever topic it is we're doing that your perspective and um, wisdom is not valuable because it absolutely is. We need all of it. So um, that's just my, that's just my plea to all of you. I think you have been really incredible at offering up your perspectives and wisdom, and I just want to continue to encourage that because I think that it gets us to a stronger outcome. And I really wish that you know we could do so together in person as well, but you know we'll hope to do that soon. So with that, um, we have a lot in front of us. So I'm going to hand it off to Douglas Jester and Commissioner Catherine Paratic. Take us away, work group. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Liesl. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so, okay, we're getting our slides up, it looks like. Um, I, I will get started on the first few slides and then pass it over to Douglas, um, a few slides in for him to, uh, to talk about um, some of the meat of these recommendations, but I'll start off by setting the stage. So um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to present our work group's results. Um, it's been a lot of work over the last six months and um, it feels great to be here and, uh, and actually presenting these to you, to the council who will uh, now take these and, and do something with these recommendations. So uh, as we only have 10-ish minutes at the beginning here to talk, um, Douglas and I have decided to focus our, uh, to focus our uh, discussion right now on our work group's process since you've already had the opportunity to read our recommendations and have su already submitted your thoughts via a survey. Um, so we can start with the first slide. Uh, Douglas and I very much owe our success as a work group to our planning team. Um, a huge thank you to uh, Jill Rusnak and Sarah Molkoff from the MPSC, as well as Trevor Drake, Trevor Drake from GPI. Um, there's no way we could have gotten through these last six months without you, so thank you. Um, an important note as we go through this presentation um, that might be a little bit different from some of the other work groups who have presented is that we saw our role as facilitators of this process, not as authors of the recommendations. Um, this was, uh, so no endorsement necessarily of these recommendations is implied by the fact that we are presenting them to you now. This was a consensus uh, sorry, this was a process of our work group members. Um, additionally, consensus was not obtained um, and was not that was not the goal of, uh, of our work group throughout this. But all suggestions were considered and were very well documented. So um, everyone has had an opportunity to provide those comments and and we have those um, 
you know, the, we have that documented throughout. Um, another final important note about this work group that Douglas and I ran is um, that this topic, the topic of energy production, transmission, distribution, and storage is really fundamental. Um, it is quite at the core of our state's energy future. Our challenge was to tackle you know, production, transmission, distribution, storage, and where this energy comes from, how it gets to where it is needed. Um, you know, that's that's really the foundation of where we start. It's the foundation of our journey to reducing these carbon emissions. And this task in front of us was large. Um, and it covered topics from fossil fuel extraction and production in our state to individuals' rooftop solar panels and to the complexities of connecting those to the distribution system. It covered new technologies like hydrogen, um, for generation or lithium ion batteries for storage. Uh, it covered detailed and wonky topics like performance based rate making and utility IRPs or rulemaking processes that go through the state. Um, it was a, a really, really wide range. We talked about scales from quite small, like individual homeowners in the UP who wanted to go off grid, to large scales of impacts of market wide changes on our state's investor owned utilities. and to interstate high voltage transmission lines or the future of financing. Um, this was a big topic and we had six months to do it. So um, the interconnectedness and dependency of on everything that we do in our state to, to this topic, to energy production and usage uh, became quickly apparent to us at the beginning of this process. Um, and I, I do want to start off by sincerely thanking all 150 plus diverse stakeholders who participated in this process over the last six months, uh, for, really for their patience, for their support, for their excellent suggestions, um, for their participation in sometimes very difficult deliberations. And I ultimately credit them for the recommendations that we were able to send to you, the council. Okay, next slide. So I wanted to give you a bit of detail on what the participants looked like and what this process looked like. So we had a lot of differing levels of expertise, different levels of understanding and different backgrounds. And just like Liesl mentioned at the beginning, which I loved, that gave us a lot of strength. That provided a, a great foundation for effective and valuable input. A diversity in, of, in thought and opinion really does provide the most robust results. And we had, quite a diversity in thought and opinion uh, throughout this process. Um, but it also required substantial stage setting to establish that shared foundation of the current state of energy production, transmission, distribution, and storage. I'm getting better at saying that quickly. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and what that landscape actually looks like. So we started off with a set of speakers that included utilities, um, so IOUs, municipals, co-ops, it included transmission owners and operators, third party technical and policy experts. And we also included a, pre a presentation from the Office of Environmental Justice Public Advocate to set the stage for robust inclusion of equity and EJ effects. All right, next slide. So um, the substance and participation was too big to deliberate as a group of 150. So we split into eight subgroups um, that had a, probably an active weekly part or participation of bet between 10 and 15 members in each one of these subgroups for detailed deliberation and recommendation formation. So this is where the, the real deliberation happened and where the recommendations were written was were in these subgroups within our work group. Um, these subgroup topics were determined by our membership and was set by a survey that was sent to all members. You can see one of the results of one of the questions here on the slide in front of you right now. This one was about um, importance of how you think Michigan can reach its decarbonization goals. Um, and you can see they're, they're ordered here. The software ordered them um, on a weighted average of uh, first choice to last choice. So policy and regulatory changes, utility rate design, advanced technologies, financing, et cetera. Um, so we spent uh, four meetings of facilitated deliberation that were scheduled throughout July and August. And then each one of those individual subgroups did additional work 
outside of those scheduled meetings via email, phone, or however they wanted to communicate, including additional scheduled meetings um, outside of those facilitated times. And it was really impressive, the amount of participation and the number of hours, really, that we got from these work group members who put forth um, their efforts into this uh, into this process. OK, next slide. So um, this is this is my last one that I'm going to hand it over to you, Douglas. Um, I think so. Uh, we we did maintain. We made sure to maintain a focus on the goals of the council throughout the process. We had a reminder on what we were trying to accomplish at the beginning of each meeting to make sure that we were talking about the right things. Um, this resulted in really excellent debate and deliberations throughout, um, and our, our really phenomenal superstar planning team was able to maintain robust documentation of all of these viewpoints, all of our comments, our changes, and our input throughout the process. So this resulted in a list of 73 independent recommendations that were submitted to you and that you had the opportunity to review in addition to the five, the, our five top ones, if you would like to. Um, and they are really fantastic. And I do recommend digging into some of those uh, to get some more detail and to get the, the, um, the, the real uh, nuanced view of the work groups uh, that, that we did throughout this process. So um, one more important note is that uh, partway through the subgroup deliberations process, we invited the Council on Climate Brain Trust back to provide feedback on our drafts um, for equity and EJ impacts and how we could improve before finalization. And while I think everyone in our work group would admit that that was a bit messy, we felt it was important to maintain that focus throughout the process and not just at the beginning and the end. So there was an opportunity to provide real shaping to those recommendations that were in progress around equity and EJ. So then we spent two more meetings together to attempt to resolve those differences, finalize the recommendations list, and that allowed our work group members to provide those improvements um, to the recommendations that they were not directly deliberating. And it resulted in some really great suggestions um, and diverse perspectives that we were able to incorporate. Um, so we, found, we sent a final survey after the final recommendations were written, and now I'm going to pass it over to Douglas, who will discuss on the next few slides the recommendations and the feedback that we received from that final survey. Thank you, Catherine. And I do want to join in thanking uh, the team that worked with us on this. It was an enormous effort. We really could not have done it without them. So <clears throat> in the end, we we're obligated to boil our recommendations to you down uh, to five primary recommendations. And we did that um, by grouping the 73 into topics uh, and then trying to uh, synthesize those into a thematic statement. If you look at the detailed topics within each, you'll find um, that there's diversity there. Um, and they hang together more by being about the same subject than being a sort of single strategy to address you know, that particular topic. Uh, that is just where we are in uh, Michigan on these issues at this point. The, so the five things that <clears throat> we forwarded to you as um, primary recommendations uh, are shown on this slide. And I want to emphasize that in each of them, there is a character of things that need to be done now, but also that there will be significant uh, uncertainties, changes uh, over the period that we're working through this strategy. And so they have to be iterative, uh, plan and do processes rather than that we can lay out today a single path that gets us all the way to decarbonization of the economy by 2050. <clears throat> but these are the areas where we think the work lies. So the one at the top, the evaluate gas system regulatory and policy options. We fundamentally have two different views 
uh, within the work group about uh, the future of the gas system. Um, one is that <clears throat> there's really not any way to decarbonize without radically reducing the use of gas, primarily through electrification. And we need to think about the strategies for uh, electrifying transportation in buildings as were recommended by the other work groups, and then think about how we unwind uh, the gas system, both financially and physically. The other alternative is to think that we're somehow delivering uh, gaseous fuels through the gas distribution system and either uh, replacing some or all of that natural gas with other materials uh, or using offsetting uh, to uh, eliminate the carbon impacts of continuing to use uh, natural gas. That choice um, is something that needs to be based in a lot more empirical information, modeling, uh, and deliberation than we were able to provide. And so that recommendation really contains both of those and the need for us to iteratively sort them out and decide on the course of action we ultimately take. The next to the right, implementing holistic integrated and energy system planning <clears throat> in part echoes what I just talked about with gas, but also speaks to the fact that um, all of these systems are in, interrelated and integrated, uh, both with uh, different elements of uh, energy uh, systems, but also with the whole economy. And so there will have to be this process of planning on a grand scale and implementing incrementally and then replanning. In the case of natural gas and oil, for the most part, any reductions in carbon emissions likely come from uh, changes in end uses that were addressed by other work groups. In the case of electricity, the carbon emissions come from the generation of electricity that is within our scope. So within this integrated energy system planning category, we certainly have integrated resource planning uh, for uh, electricity as a significant part of that and increasing needs to integrate not only sort of traditional electricity resource planning, but also uh, transmission distribution and storage planning. And those will become increasingly important as the electricity systems uh, change from large centralized fossil fuel generation to uh, other forms of generation, which may be more variable in time and more distributed. One of the things that stands out uh, in this particular category is we have tools for uh, planning. The commission, the Michigan Public Service Commission is charged with overseeing the electricity planning, but um, the standards really don't specify the path that we're going to take to decarbonize. There's supposed to be reasonable and prudent plans and consider uh, environmental regulations, costs, risks, and any number of other things, but there's nothing in the guidance to the commission from the legislature that says decarbonize on a certain path or at a certain rate. And so that is an area that I think that this council should be thinking about. As we looked at what it's going to take to decarbonize electricity, it is likely that a lot of that is going to be renewables, and that leads to um, a challenge with siting. It is practical, uh, we believe, to put enough renewables on the landscape in Michigan to decarbonize, but it is not easy. And we need to do a lot of work um, with policy and uh, with our citizens to address siting. So that is a topic that we address. Um, the interface between electricity and the rest of the economy is through rates um, that users of electricity pay and the price signals and incentives that come to them for what they should be doing uh, are set through rate design. 
So we viewed that as particularly important. And then finally, <clears throat> both as a matter of a potential place for citing a lot of renewables, but also uh, to mitigate um, requirements on the transmission distribution and utility scale storage, uh, behind the meter resources can play a significant role. And this is an area where there's a lot of um, difference of opinion, shall we say, uh, but where there's potentially a large role. And so there are recommendations on that topic. So next slide. Um, Catherine went through a lot of this, but just to draw a fine point on it, we had six meetings that were essentially uh, presentations by the major actors in the energy system, the utilities, transmission owners, and so on, um, as well as some national labs uh, and other organizations, just really providing a foundation for all of the participants. Then we did the survey and identified subgroups, uh, formed those, and those subgroups met and discussed and deliberated and made recommendations, which we then presented back to the group and tried to resolve to the extent we could, but we were not seeking consensus, uh, rather trying to make sure that everyone who had a valid idea had the opportunity for that to be presented to you. And then finally, we did a closing survey. In the next slide, I want to summarize the results of that closing survey. <clears throat> the overwhelming response was that it was um, hard uh, to agree or disagree on these five because each of them subsumed so many distinct recommendations. And most of the participants found that they agreed with some of the recommendations within each category and disagreed with others. So uh, there's a lot of nuance in the 73 recommendations that was lost in our aggregation up to the five, and we want to draw your attention to that. Um, there was a general sense that most people thought the process worked pretty well and were impressed with the scope of the and content of the final uh, work product. But at the same time, many felt rushed to cover this scope in this amount of time. Um, and so we're going to have to, in the end, have the council guidance go to the administration, the commission, and others, and we're all going to have to keep working on these topics in great detail over the next several years. Catherine, back to you. <clears throat> all right, just two quick slides left. Um, you can go on to the next one. And um, just wanted to quickly highlight some of the impacts of on equity and environmental justice for some of the for these recommendations that were put forth um, and these filtered up through those recommendation templates. Um, because you know, we, we were tasked both equally with decarbonization and with improving equity and environmental justice. So um, the results of these recommendations will result in lower emissions in disproportionately impacted communities. Um, work to increase reliability and resiliency of the electric grid with the hopes of more fairly distribu distributing these benefits, um, improving health impacts on low-income communities, increasing jobs in new sectors, providing fairer compensation for services provided, and directly supporting communities that have been direct disproportionately impacted by our current grid and the changing climate. Um, and if you want any more details on any of those, it's, it's all in those recommendations templates. Um, okay, next slide, final slide, um, are on our takeaways. So there really were a large number of recommendations that were put forth by the members. And uh, while some of that nuance was lost during the consolidation down to just five, um, these five things do encompass the overarching points of our six months of work. So, um, and, and like I mentioned, the sub, sub recommendations really do contain a, some great further details that are found on those separate templates and highly recommend um, digging into some of those. We had um, a really uh, committed and passionate state group of stakeholders who were very dedicated to this process. Um, and we feel like a, a wide range of viewpoints and varied levels of consensus um, were, uh, were really captured um, in, in these recommendations that we're putting forth. 
um, you know, many stakeholders indicated such a willingness to continue to provide input and contribute to this ambitious goal even after um, submitting to the council. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out. And then just one final point that I'd like to highlight and that Douglas did a great job of highlighting in talking through the recommendations is that this is going to be a substantial and iterative process. Uh, we really don't know the circumstances a decade or two from now, so we need to plan for that. The process needs to be institutionalized through planning and iteration, and cooperation is going to be needed through all levels of government and through the private sector, through industry. Everyone is going to need to cooperate to be able to successfully achieve this. Um, and then in addition, a continual focus on equity and, and environmental justice is needed, and the emphasis on planning is meant to maintain this focus. So we will not accomplish our equity and environmental justice goals without deliberate inclusion, and that needs to stay at, our, at the forefront. So um, this is this is new ground. <laughs> this is a new foundation. Um, there will be unintended consequences, and we can't jump in without deliberate thought and coordination. Um, these actions that we're putting in front of you right now have real consequences, um, and we need to make sure that we're making the right choices for the future of our state. Oh yeah, no, it's. A second, I mean, like, I guess if the crimper was um, better, or I'm sorry, the. Okay, so yeah, we're not all muted. Oh, yeah. Just make sure we're all muted. Well, that was a wonderful overview, Catherine and Douglas. Um, anything else that the two of you wanted to put in front of us before I hand it over to Doug to begin our deliberations? Uh, we could talk about this for six months if you'd like. So just let us know. <laughs> so you're saying it's my enviable job to give you the hook and move us into conversations yes. amongst the council. Oh, darn it. Okay. Well, um, very grateful as usual to our co-chairs. Um, and I think you both really well captured um, how complicated this topic is and um, how important it was to step through it methodically and do the work that we could do within the time frame that we had. So that I'm going to hand it over to Doug Scott, uh, our fearless leader from GPI, to take us through a conversation amongst ourselves about what we see in these recommendations. Great. Thanks, Director. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to be with you again. I apologize for missing the last meeting, but it's good to be back uh, with you. And um, thank you to uh, Commissioner Paratic and to Douglas for leading us through not just that process, but also uh, just summarizing it today. You can see how, how you know all the detail and just in the summarization of it. So there's a there's a lot of material here, as you know, um, as you went through the recommendations. There's a ton of work that went behind it. Um, so you've got the five summarized recommendations, and then as as uh, was just said, there are. 73 recommendations in total that fit into one of those uh, one of those buckets and you've had the materials to look at that there was also a survey that went out um, got a handful of responses I think seven people responded to the survey um, so we, you know if if a point of view hasn't been raised that was raised in some of those questions I, I may actually call on folks to um, to reiterate what they put in the in the survey so folks could see them so you know, as we talk about the recommendations, um, and I'm going to be really brief here. So, you know, let's let's talk about if there's anything missing from the particular recommendations that are there, or the backup material for them. Um, talk about the timing, how fast some of these things are are scheduled to happen. You know, what is the overall timing there, uh, and then all the equity considerations that the commissioner just just laid out. How how does that play out here? Um, what's the as we look at it through the equity lens, you know, what does that look like? Practical considerations of trying to do some of these, whatever makes the most sense for you as a council member to to give feedback on, um, you know, that showed up through the these kinds of things showed up through the process. It showed up in the survey results. And um, so that's uh, the discussion we want to have today. Um, Y'all know the drill by now. Uh, raise your hand. Uh, use the raise your hand function uh, on the participant list, and I will get to you in the order that uh, that I see folks uh, raise their hand. And we will. We've got a little bit less than 90 minutes here, so that's that's a lot of time, but it's not given the kind of the the, the breadth and depth of the recommendations that we've got in front of us. So. Um, 
feel free. Anybody who wants to wants to lead us off. Now everybody's shy. I see one hand up. Ah, uh, Peck. Hi, I just want to thank Catherine and Douglas. Um, this sounds like a really interesting process. And uh, it's way too techy for me to fully get my mind around it and not a policy person, for example. Um, but I'm curious about the process. And I, this may be putting you on the spot, a little hot seat, but I'm wondering if you could outline in a compelling way what some of the biggest biases might have might be because of the process you used. In other words, you didn't reach a consensus. You didn't have any uh, special process to ensure equal representativeness of the folks involved. So you could easily see certain factions perhaps having an outside uh, influence uh, leading to your recommendations. But I'm you. I'm sure you both given your backgrounds, have a sense of what the biases could be and what we should be worried about. Douglas or Commissioner, we want to handle that one? You can punt too, because I know it's <laughs> really hard. Good, Catherine, if you have fun. something, I'll follow. Okay, uh, please, yeah, follow on. Um, but yeah, I, it's, that was one of our concerns throughout the whole process. You're you're right, um, That was that was something that you know, we we tried to balance wherever we could, and that was um, part of the reason for dividing into the eight subgroups as opposed to keeping everybody together. Um, the eight subgroups allowed us to try to uh, provide some balance um, and provide a uh, more accessible platform, I think, to not just the loudest voices in the room. Um, and then we also provided um, different um, methods of incorporate of, of providing feedback and incorporating feedback. It could I, it, it could be during the um, the uh, work group meetings live, if um, if anyone wanted to just like this pipe up in a meeting. But we also understood that not everybody could make all of the meetings or uh, was not comfortable talking in front of that many people. So we provided the opportunity to provide comments in writing, um, uh, either to um, uh, to us, to directly to the council, or to the facilitators of their small subgroup. Um, and uh, we also uh, attempted to provide some sort of balance, however we could, or at least diversity, um, when we set the leadership for those eight subgroups. So I didn't go into all of the details because again, we could be talking for as long as we wanted to, but those eight, those eight subgroups had, um, had two leaders um, that were helping to facilitate those discussions. And we tried to provide some sort of diversity of background and um, opinion for uh, the leadership of each one of those subgroups. So everyone would feel comfortable putting forth their ideas. Douglas, what did I miss? Yeah, there, there's an almost universal bias in that basically everyone participating is some kind of energy wonk. <laughs> <laughs> um, that said, um, you know, we started out with presentations essentially by utilities. And by the time that was done, there was a decent amount of grousing by the non-utility people about that. We felt it was necessary because that was the starting place, what is actually happening and what is in their current plans and so on. Um, I would say that um, after that, when you start to look at the uh, various topics, there are sort of natural camps. You know, on the gas side, I described it. There are basically those who say gas is going to have to come to an end and those who say, no, we can preserve it by doing some mitigation measures. On um, distributed generation, there's pretty big divide between utilities and those who work with them and then, uh, you know, advocates for solar and uh, environmental perspectives and so on who you know, really want to push behind the meter resources. Um, on the siting, most of the people involved um, 
are in favor of of citing renewables. There weren't a lot of people participating in the process who are opposed to renewables, and so you know there probably is a a bit of a bias there, but it was still approached as a problem solving thing where we need to get community acceptance or consensus. Um, and then I would say that there were some and, and probably more utilities in this camp uh, than others who thought that the emphasis on the price of electricity, the rate design was misplaced, that that is somehow uh, more of a mechanical thing of utilities getting the revenue that they should get uh, and not something that should be thought about in behavioral terms. So those that's my take on kind of where the camps fell in the various topics. Very, very good. Nice, very thorough too. Thank you for, for doing that. Thanks for asking the question, Peck. Alyssa or Kimber, I can't remember which one of you is doing this, but could you put the recommendation, the five recommendations, the summarized recommendations up on the screen, please, for us? And as you're doing that, um, I've got uh, Mary Draves first in the queue. Mary? Yes, thanks very much. And I uh, appreciate the summary. Um, I had a chance to take a look at it over the course of the last couple of days. A couple of things I've heard um, kind of consistently is that we didn't reach consensus. And, you know, maybe my question to you, that doesn't surprise me um, because of the nature of the recommendations. Um, and so I'm curious to hear why that that seems to be kind of um, a topic you keep bringing up. Did you think that you needed to reach consensus um, on the recommendations? Um, and if you didn't reach consensus, you know, uh, why, why do you think you didn't? The second question I, I have maybe for you is, there are 70 some odd recommendations here. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I, I think I've lost count. I think that the the, type, the entire um, body of recommendations now is in the, the other document I saw is like 250 some odd pages, right? I, I think if, if I'm correct, where do you start? You know, if you, you, you know, on this particular list of recommendations, where did the, where would you say that the work group would say, hey, starting here is going to lead us to the best possible end result? I'll go first, I guess. Um, go ahead, Douglas. So <clears throat> these topics are things that have been contested already uh, for several years here in Michigan. So we never anticipated that we would be able to get to a consensus. Um, we instead tried to create a process that would surface everybody's recommendations and present you with as good a picture as we could. Um, ultimately, we'll have to at least arrive at policy, if not consensus on policy, in order to get this work done. Um, it's just not something that a work group of our character could do. So our intent really was to make sure that anybody who had a view that they held strongly enough that they wanted to persist could have that surface in the report and that's part of why you see so much material um, as to where we begin I, I do think that the five items that we uh, highlighted are the areas where there should be immediate work within each there would be priorities but we already have an uh, electric system integrated resource planning process uh, which is iterative and underway um, those recommendations can that you support could be conveyed to the Public Service Commission and filter into that. On the gas side, we do not currently have any kind of a planning process that naturally addresses uh, the issues that were raised and that need to be addressed. And so one will have to be created. Um, perhaps that can be done administratively. Perhaps it has to be legislative. That's a debate that needs to be had. Um, the other three topics are unfortunately sort of complicated, um, but we recommended that state government have a single sort of not authority, but a single place of thinking about citing. Uh, and our initial thought was Eagle. So sort of putting that together and then assigning them to work through all those issues uh, over time. Um, Public Service Commission already deals with rate design. Uh, 
and that is something that is ongoing, but we need to bring additional thinking into it. And then finally, the distributed generation topic is currently contested both legislatively and before the commission and not likely to be resolved without the legislature. Um, so there are things we can do there, but ultimately I think that topic requires that we reach some level of political consensus. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mary. Um, and if you have a particular uh, recommendation you want to ask about, let us know, because I think we've got each of them on a slide. So if you want to ask about a particular one, um, we'll put that up as you're asking. Uh, Brandon Hoffmeyer is next and then Darrell Slaughter. Yeah, thanks, Doug, and thanks um, to Commissioner Paratic and, and Douglas for all the, the work on this immense task that you um, so um, documented so well the enormity of all, all these inter, interrelated issues. Um, my question is, is less on the policy recommendations and more, I think, specifically for Douglas. In the materials we got, I noticed that you had done some analysis on pathways to net zero and what 2030 might look like from a sector perspective. And I was curious about what was in your thinking and what mm -hmm. was behind those numbers. I think, you know, sure. to, to the point we've had earlier, there's lots of policies that could enable emissions reduction, <coughs> but I wonder if there's a way we can get um, progress and alignment on pathways by sector that we could actually have targets for in the near term, and then we can figure out the policies that can get us there. So I'm interested in unpacking um, that piece of work a little more and understanding your thinking mm -hmm. behind it. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Some of this was presented in, I think, the first or second meeting of the council, and then I elaborated it a bit here. But so the basics are that about 90% of the carbon emissions <clears throat> uh, in Michigan and this is true in the U.S. as well, uh, are from energy production or transformation, it, it, the use of energy. And when you break that down <clears throat> by sort of traditional sectors, um, broadly a third of it is in the generation of electricity, excuse me, a quarter of it is in the gener generation of electricity, a quarter of it uh, is from transportation, a quarter of it is from uh, buildings uh, and other uh, heating. And then the last quarter is a mixture of methane emissions and uh, other products that, that have an effect <clears throat> on climate. If you start where we are today, and this is where uh, the work that you're referring to, and ask, well, what can we reasonably expect? I assumed that we would take Kind of the most aggressive path of uh, vehicle electrification that anybody out there is forecasting. So assume that the auto manufacturers are going to electrify sort of as fast as they can, that we're going to build out infrastructure, but that people are going to replace cars and trucks when they need to, not earlier. So we're essentially to 100% electric sales by say 2035. But given that the, the stock turnover, that doesn't eliminate the use of fossil fuels for transportation until 2050 or later. Same kind of analysis with um, heating uh, in buildings. And then a little bit looser, but sort of similarly asking what is possible with industrial emissions and how much carbon reduction would we get from all of those and then I looked at what was left as potentially a responsibility for power generation which is the sector that has done the most decarbonization in the last 15 years and what could be done there and the short answer is to achieve the 28% reduction by 2025, um, economy-wide, <clears throat> we can do that, provided that consumers' proposal to retire all of its coal plants uh, by 2025 uh, happens. And we cannot 
achieve the 50% reduction by 2030 that is also in the uh, nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement, um, unless DTE also retires all of its coal plants by 2030. And in doing so, neither of these major utilities replaces coal with new gas. That's how hard the problem is. So um, that analysis was really just what's the most aggressive thing we can imagine actually happening and where does that put us? After 2030, I'm not sure it's worth going into a great deal of detail of uh, the pathway because there's so many technological and economic uncertainties uh, as you go beyond 2030 and toward 2040 that there are many pathways that may emerge. Thanks, thanks, Douglas. And Brandon, I know you made comments in the survey, so I may come back to you at some point. But um, Darrell, you're up. Darrell, you're up next. And I know you had you had comments that you made in the survey as well. So uh, you've got the floor, sir. Thank you, Doug. And uh, just like everyone else, uh, thank you, Commissioner Piertic and, and Douglas for all your work uh, with the, the work group. I, you know, participated in a handful of those work groups. I know it was a uh, at, at times uh, could be a unwieldy bunch, but a lot of passion and a lot of um, folks that really want to work on this issue. So big kudos there. Um, actually, the comment I was going to make, I think Douglas started to um, partially um, address, um, I guess, is looking at, um, I guess it would fit under this first recommendation, which is on the screen about this holistic planning. What I found was, was missing was, you know, I guess, an overarching like goal, uh, like uh, decarbonize or decarbonization goal for the, the energy sector, energy production sector. Um, you know, particularly addressing those issues that I mean, Douglas just talked about. I mean, in terms of I've been reading up and becoming uh, more knowledgeable in terms of the different studies and out there. And yeah, I'm I'm seeing the same things. You know, in terms of meeting those goals. Uh, by 2030, um, really, unless we shut down our coal plants and, and no replacement gas, it's going to be really difficult or pretty much impossible to meet those goals at 2030. But um, I guess my question, I mean, was there ever a, a discussion in the work group uh, about some having some sector specific goal, knowing that um, that is part of uh, the challenge that we have, that we have to, to move faster? Um, particularly in this sector, but I would just love to hear Commissioner Peritick or Douglas on this point. Mm -hmm. Douglas or Commissioner? Commissioner, you want to take this one first? Sure, sure, because it's a it's a really easy answer, so I'll take that one. Um, <laughs> uh, Darrell, that was a, a perfect um, example that you just gave us to show how our process worked is that uh, you provided that feedback um, as part of the, um, I think, the final survey or maybe just before the final survey, and we did incorporate it into this recommendation. So it is in the final version. It's not on the version that's on the screen right now because this is just a summary, but it is in the, um, the final version that's in front of the council. Thank you. Drill, anything else? Um, that's it for on this particular recommendation. I'll, I'll probably have more later, but. Thanks. Uh, Phil Roos. Hi, um, I'll echo the kudos and thanks to the co-chairs and the work group. Um, hearing all this talk about not coming to consensus um, uh, has got my anxiety going a little bit, uh, and I appreciate what you've had to go through here. And I'm, I'm just trying to think of some ways that we might get some momentum in the discussion and figure out, uh, you know, kind of uh, avoid inertia, which is probably our worst enemy here, or many, many years of studying many things. Um, I just got a couple of kind of overall questions. Uh, the, the first one is, is there consensus on the five high level recommendations? Forget about the specifics underneath them, but is there agreement that those five things need to be done? Uh, let me just ask that first and then uh, I'll go further. I would highlight two of them as disputed. <clears throat> um, one is okay. whether 
um, rate design plays a role in decarbonization, or if it's a more mechanical thing uh, right. that, that just happens. The other is the importance or lack of importance of distributed resources. Okay. Uh, energy resources, so generation and storage. Okay. And and we, if you drill down into the other three, is there a fair amount of consensus, or is it really a, are there some big areas of disagreement even within the three areas where the high level recommendation is has got some consensus? The the, on the gas topic, um, yeah, there it. really are the two major pathways yeah. that that there's not consensus on. I would say within each, there's probably a fair amount of consensus on what would have to happen if you went down one or the other of those pathways. There's not agreement on whether, in particular, preserving the gas system and uh, providing um, modified product or uh, offsets can actually be done and achieve decarbonization. Okay. Um, on the on the power system planning and so on, it's it's really a question of uh, how fast can we go <laughs> mm -hmm. and and still maintain the certainty of supply and reliability that um, everybody thinks. And I agree with them that that we need um, in in electricity supply. Okay, uh, so I I don't want to you know force this in a particular direction, but I would it be productive for us to like you've pretty much listed the four or five areas of major disagreement? Would it be productive to sort of hear the points of view on each side there, or is that a twelve-hour discussion to to get to that? Because uh, I think it feels like that stuff needs to be aired <coughs> somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially among us, uh, those of us who aren't technical expertise, sort of a maybe a dumbed down version of those would be really helpful. And then then I think. I don't know, that feels like a place to start here is uh, can we see what the level of disagreement is? Can we all understand and have visibility to the arguments on either side and then I mean then way down the list I think is kind of what's not comments I I made on several of these is you know just sort of a yearning for even if we have to do a lot of work to model and study some of these things they're very complicated the IR you know the IRP process and where do you go with it uh, as an example um, a yearning though for some specific and more accelerated targets, uh, timing targets, and and uh, and also you know emission reduction targets and key from certain things, but uh, that's uh, down the road here. I think uh, um, anyway. I just offer that up as a as a thought here or in some other forum. I th I think this committee would benefit from he hearing some of that sort of debate on those five or six areas of disagreement. So I wanted to note uh, just at first um, that we did note those areas of disagreement in the templates. So um, I, there's a question right at the bottom of each one of the templates. Um, I forget question 11 maybe um, that uh, uh, asks about, um, you know, is there consensus on this? So on each one of those, we, we tried to outline um, where those areas of disagreement were and what the nature of that, uh, that, that, what the, that lack yeah. of consensus was. I'm sorry, you did do that. Uh... Uh, I just I guess I'm wanting to have a more robust discussion about some of those somehow. Well, and so for, you know, I mean, that's a that's a nice call, Phil. So people who have, you know, thoughts on on those, those items, uh, please, this is a good place to share them if you've got them here. And if you know, if if not, we could try to figure out a way to to crystallize those through all the work that was done through the work groups and the and the subgroups as well. But so by all means, if folks have have thoughts on some of those subjects where there was no consensus, um, that would this would be a great place to uh, to air those out. Thanks, Phil. Um, let's see. I've got uh, Dr. Meadows. Yeah, thank you, Doug. And uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, uh, Doug Douglas, this is uh, been an unenviable presentation uh, listening to you uh, 
talk about your uh, your process, but uh, so informative, and I, you know, I can't even imagine the the amount of effort it even took to get down to five recommendations. You know, I did a silent cross for you both because uh, <laughs> I know that <laughs> is hard work. Um, I just had a kind of a perspective, kind of a question too, because as I listened to the presentation, where where you seemed, where there seemed not to be the discord, and I may be um, over projecting here, but around the values around equity and workforce development, and really there there seemed to be some consensus, or am I misreading that? And if I am. I was just kind of wondering, because there is so much discord, not to say discord, but there, there's these parallel pathways, I, I think is a gentler way of describing how people are approaching this. Um, it just makes me wonder if there, if in, in, in any way in the process, another frame, I agree with Phil, there needs to be some discussion to sort of get some folks on the page but would it be also be helpful or did it even emerge that that those equity values could also serve as a frame for helping to prioritize, maybe building some consensus, recognizing that <clears throat> whatever we do, we, we, we've got to address those lower, the, the folks who are really adversely impacted or exponentially impacted. And it just makes me wonder if there might not be an opportunity to look at this body of work using that frame, if in fact of the values, you did find that there was some consensus around the value, and I'm, that's what I'm hoping. Is there a way to, to sort of add another layer of um, honing in on what, what policies, what practices we need to prioritize? Because we can't do everything, right? Not not at once, but <laughs> does that make sense to you? I see you nodding your head. I, I know I said a lot there, but. <laughs> it's okay. I was waiting for Catherine. Go ahead, Catherine. <laughs> um, just briefly. No, I, I actually, I, I, I love that way of framing it. I, I actually think that that was a, um, yeah. a, a really good way of, of thinking about that. Um, and and you are right that there was I, I don't think I've heard any um, disagreement on the need to prioritize um, equity and justice uh, as a part of our process, um, and that was uh, definitely something that, uh, that that we maintained a focus on throughout. Um, but uh, how to do that? There was some disagreement and discussion on. Um, and and what the impacts of these recommendations would be um, on equity and environmental justice differed too. So, um, you know, we we uh, attempted to you know draw out that discussion and um, have and, and document um, the process. But um, you know, it's <laughs> it's a lot. It's a complicated topic. It's a it's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of recommendations. It's a lot of, um, you know, big change and um, cooperation that's needed throughout so many different entities. And um, you know, it's it's it it is all going to be um, quite costly, and um, it's going to have different impacts on. Um, that aren't necessarily going to be easy, easy to predict. And that's um, part of where these recommendations came from, in particular with the, you know, the extensive emphasis on planning and making sure that we that we focus, that we maintain that focus on equity and environmental justice um, throughout the, the planning and um, you know, really emphasizing the, the customers and um, you know, the, the vulnerable and low income communities. Douglas, did you want to add to that? No, I think Catherine covered it very well. Thanks. Would Would it be worthwhile, maybe? And and I hate to do this to you, Douglas, because we've been putting you on the spot a lot here. But on on the two issues that you raised, where there was disputes, 
Um, you talked about rate design um, having a role in decarbonization, and you talked about the importance of of distributed resources. Can you make now? I realize that that that's not a binary choice on either one of those, and there may be variations of agreement or disagreement. But maybe just for the group's understanding, could you could you maybe just kind of of lay out um, and and in as non wonky terms as we can, you know, maybe mm -hmm. what the what the differences were on 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 some of that, if that would be helpful to the group. Sure. So first of all, the those two topics intersect in the sense that rate design influences the economics of distributed generation and storage adoption. So there's some of the thinking about rate design, uh, disputed thinking about rate design was spillover from, from that distributed resource issue. But more generally, <clears throat> if rate design is going to send signals to people, then prices have to vary. And price variation uh, presents its own challenges. It, it, it can shift who pays how much for what, uh, the total bill, and it also creates incentives for uh, behavior that we may want to worry about. So a good example is, as we sit today, the time when electricity is most expensive to provide is in the summer under the hottest conditions. So if we do through rate design say, hey, electricity is expensive at this time, then we may have people who will say, well, I can't afford it and suffer discomfort or ill health as a result. So we have to think about those things. Um, the, the sort of counter view was just take care of it all in the power system and keep it simple to people, um, you know, with with simple pricing mechanisms and not incent behavioral adjustment uh, to energy supply, absorb all of that variability uh, in what we expect utilities to do. On the distributed resources side, the there's great risk of oversimplifying here, but basically, uh, if you look at the cost of generation, per, let's particularly focus on solar, uh, per unit of electricity, it is clearly cheaper to do it in large systems owned by utilities or by third parties under contract to utilities and not with a lot of rooftop solar systems. Um, on the other hand, rooftop solar doesn't take up land that isn't already built on, uh, and it can, it, 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 it's a matter of quantity, um, reduce the capacity that's required in the transmission and distribution systems. Storage can be centralized, and again, it's, there's economy of scale there, but if you distribute storage, then you get opportunities to provide more resilience for customers. If they have storage on site, then in case of power outage, they can operate, um, particularly if they have both storage and generation. Um, and so there are a variety of different values depending on where you put these things. And that's really what that discussion is about. Thank you. So be interested in reactions from, from the group to that. And, and also, um, Douglas, you talked about the kind of the 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 really divergent opinion on on what role gas should play going forward. Um, and you know, I'm assuming number five there is a reaction to the fact that you've got that kind of binary choice about whether gas should go forward. And this is a way for for the state to best understand and the stakeholders to best understand what all the implications are of either of those positions. I'm I'm just paraphrasing, but is that, yes. a, is that a fair it characterization is. there? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to remind the folks that are on the uh, on the call that the discussion portion here is just for the council members. Um, so uh, we appreciate, uh, as Director Clark said, we appreciate everybody being on, but the the um, the Q and A portion here is just for the uh, for the council members themselves. 
uh, as as the director said, welcome comments, and there is a way to do that through the um, through the website um, here. So we we appreciate your uh, your indulgence with us on that, uh, Cynthia Reader Williams. Thanks, and and the great job to the entire team. I do think we should try to get the team back together for maybe one or two more sessions to just uh, come to a consensus or whittle those um, recommendations down a bit. I think that's a bit. Um, we, there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack. And so I do think uh, we should allow that to happen, even if we need to extend out um, when this report is issued. Um, in terms of the the rate design, I think we need to ensure um, at, as that's being done that that we that's crafted carefully so that it is it does not disadvantage lower income or EJ communities. And so that's um, something that we need to pay careful attention to. Um, in terms of uh, some of the other uh, recommendations, I I know my team um, has put a lot of thought into this, but I know one of the things that was suggested um, was to allow non-utility based companies to deploy and service charging equipment. And also as these, we, ha we have vehicles um, that will be very smart vehicles coming along on and so we need to rethink some of the rules or policies that are on the books and so utilities should allow and accept data from the vehicle uh, to help lower uh, the, the charging uh, costs and in, in turn in, in in lieu of you know having to uh, someone have to install a secondary meter so those are some of the things i think we we need to consider um, and it actually will help lower costs for some of the constituents as well. Um, and we're, we're, you know, you have the big three here. And so if we need to put together a pilot where we share data with you to help you come to a, a, a consensus on that, we can do that. Thanks. And let me ask you a question, if I could, on the on the um, on the equity portions. Are there some specific things in addition to what what are in the recommendations? um that 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 you would like to see that are that are in there i mean i know there's discussion of a specific low income rate for example i mean are there additional things like that in rate design that you would like to you would like to see not in particular not, nothing uh specific okay. but we need to just make sure we pay careful attention to to that because um uh, even you know lower middle income to you know lower income families um we, we need to make sure everyone can afford uh, to live in this environment in the future. Right. So just right. pay careful attention to that. Thanks. Very good. Thanks. Uh, Ron. Yeah, um, would like to echo a little bit what Cynthia just talked about, too. As we look at the technology, I know that was one that didn't have a lot of consensus and there was some, some back and forth around what is behind the meter and and I don't I'm not necessarily stuck around the idea of behind the meter but more along Cynthia's line of of thought here around this demand flexibility and, and information and and exchange not just limited to vehicle but other technologies and demand if, as we look at the transition it's going to be a long I mean I don't think anybody said anything before 2050 a long road for those those generation built environments in the same condition you know it's 50 to 100 years at, at a current rate of if we don't include this idea of retrofit and the idea of flexibility and i think time is one of those underestimated resources in that flexibility to rapidly increase to uh, at least obviously not 100 percent, but you know that higher saturation point where other other um other ones of these recommendations can play a bigger role. And I think we, we underestimate the idea of virtual batteries, of virtual, you know, of, of demand flexibility in these recommendations, especially if, if combined with some of the other recommendations from the other groups like retrofits and others targeted at those those communities, you know, low income communities, they should in, in a prioritization path, I think you could really um, enable something that that creates a structural change. And I think and allows for the transition to happen much faster. And I think that's what we all talk about. And I think that's where the rate design does play a, a significant role, consumer behavior, consumer attitudes, and the ability to control is one, you know, if we just put all the control in one bucket, you can see where we didn't get a consensus, right? So I think this is where it shifts a little bit of the conversation to control and, 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 and availability. So I think as we look at 
it's not just decarbonization, but also flexibility to allow that decarbonization transition to happen quickly. And I think that's, for me, you know, storage and all those other things will be technologies that will take time. Whether you talk about, you know, gas alternatives will take extreme amount of time. How do we at least take advantage of what's out there today to quickly hit those 2030s as I, as I think about it are those technologies that already exist today. And I, I think whether it's, you know, connected, um, you know, appliances, you know, EVs, others that, that are available to do those sort of things, as well as some of the abilities to create a more distributed resilient um, grid all become uh, allows for that rapid expansion because I mean, let's be honest, it's not we're not near where some of the other one, you know, other states are, let alone other countries are and, and proven those, those capabilities to do that in an effective and cost effective manner. So you're saying you're saying use technology, grid optimization, rate design as kind of the yeah. things to to really get you started while some of the other bigger ticket items are are coming into effect or you're working on them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where I think policy and, and, and smart policy can do that rel relatively quickly because that doesn't require, you know, the investment infrastructure build outs that, that are going to take an extreme amount of time. I agree with those other ones. Siting is a, is a key one to allow those, in, in, you know, investments to happen in, in a timely manner. But those are still going to be long term, you know, investments and costs, right? Because those costs can't be done instantaneously or without disruption. So, um, yeah, for sure. That's those. Those are the policy and different. I would say even just um, model capabilities that allow us to to do things quite differently quickly, to at least extract what we can in a, in a short period of time. Great. Thanks, Ron. Um, anybody else on that point that they want to they want to uh, chime in on? I see Tanya's in the queue, so I'll call on her. Tanya? Yes, sorry. You no, that's okay. <laughs> um, I really appreciate what Ron said. And I guess just to share a couple of my thoughts at a relatively high level. And just one is, this is obviously complicated, as has been said. But I think most importantly, we don't have time to delay. We need to act. And I like, you know, what Ron is saying is that we do have some things in front of us today and some things we obviously need to wait for technology to catch up um, and wait for policy to change. We're turning a big ship around here. But keeping focused on we have to do everything we can as quickly as we can with all the considerations that have been shared, but not to lose sight that that there isn't a timing an important timing consideration in this work. Um, and to, again, keep in mind the, we are sort of, you know, completely reinventing the utility, the way we think about utility infrastructure and the provision of services. And again, some of the technology and the demand response stuff the, um, what that's making available for customers and the control that they can have, as has been mentioned, just that role of the customer versus the role of utility versus the role of third parties. Everything is sort of up in the air to try to accomplish these goals. And um, so I think of those things a lot in the context of consensus and why this is so hard is that we are, we are really changing fundamentally the way that utility services are delivered in this country and, and in this state and in the world. And so it is gonna be hard. There will always be folks who are fighting change. And this is really massive, massive change. So I say that only in support of what I know, I've participated in some of these work groups and just have to share the kudos to the chairs and to the folks who were supporting this work because it was a massive undertaking, very well done and organized and we just have a whole lot to do in this space and that it is it is tangible now. There is a lot that we can do now. So I appreciate without getting into um, the specifics, uh, just uh, appreciate the need to move forward and the ideas that have been put on the table to try to do that. Thank you. Great, thanks. 
I might be missing it, but oh, okay. I was just, you know, I was going to start calling on the folks that had um, that had submitted comments uh, into the survey, and and Sam, you must have anticipated that because you raised your hand right away. So Sam, let me let me call on you first. Okay, um, thanks, Doug. Um, sure. Okay, thanks, Commissioner Paratic uh, and Douglas. Uh, it seems like we all agree you had a really really hard job, um, and. I'm really impressed and thankful for for the job you did, um, and and I and I appreciated your sort of uh, setting the stage slides too, um, and and talking before we started with this discussion. Um, I have I guess I got I want to say something about rate design and something about the scale of renewables, which I think are the two uh, are are two of the biggest sources of disagreement. Um, just my perspective on them. I'll try to be brief. Um, I don't believe that a focus on rate design and prices is misplaced. I, I think it's really, really important. I think this council's report should be explicit about ways to ensure equity everywhere that climate and climate policy touches. Uh, and if we decarbonize in such a way that bills go up relatively more among the poor than among the rich, you know, think of energy burden, how much you're spending out of your income or wealth on, on, on energy. If we if we decarbonize in such a way that energy burdens uh, uh, increase more for the poor, then I think we're failing. Uh, part of the reason we have existing regressive energy burdens is, I think, uh, you know, a, a history of unequal uh, of of wealth inequality, of income inequality, and that to me suggests that part of a major part of the solution is redistribution. And progressive rate design is the way we do that in the electricity sector. Um, for instance, you know, uh, Cynthia uh, um, mentioned prices, um, ensuring uh, equity in prices. There was a question about low income rates. Um, I'm really interested in, in pursuit of equity. I'm really interested in and think we should seriously consider making the fixed charges on one's energy bill progressive. When I say fixed charges, I'm differentiating between um, between the part that is the same amount, the cost on your bill that's the same amount, um, regardless of how you how much electricity you consume, and then variable prices are the ones that's the price of each additional, each marginal unit of, of energy consumed. I think we should make the fixed part of rates progressive. Right. Mechanically, identically, that that's going to move us closer to, to equity, because um, uh, if your income is lower, you'll have your bill will go down by more as a result of that progressive fixed charge. But focusing on the fixed charge, I think, is important. Not to say ignore the variable charge, but the, focusing on the fixed charge is important because when we reduce the marginal cost of electricity consumption, people do more of it. Putting the pu putting that progressive reform um, heavily on the fixed component, I think, does less of that. And 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 I and so I think that's something that I think that's an example of of rate design that could be could really be helpful in making these really costly changes um, we're going to make digestible. Um, more briefly on the subject of the scale of renewables. I, it's hard for me to disentangle these. I think they're, you know, they're really interrelated. Um, economies of scale, I think, are really important personally because they yield significant overall cost savings. And, but it's important to note that any cost savings we can get overall can be funneled to low-income households through rate reform, through that rate redistribution. Or, or another thing we can do with those is use them in part to make siting in specific places um, um, amenable to the affected communities. Cost savings overall are good. And with rate design, I think we can, uh, with, with economies of scale, I think we can reduce those costs overall. But I also think, you know, I think if we don't also make rates, you know, move towards um, progressive rate reform, then we're blowing it. And, I, and furthermore, I think on the subject of scale, while we should embrace utility scale renewables, in my belief, it still feels like, so I totally agree with what Douglas said, there's value in distributed generation. 
for various reasons, energy storage, um, uh, smoothing things out across space. Um, and on top of that, it feels, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels, I think to many, like the laws currently obstruct rooftop solar beyond what is socially justified by economics. So I think I personally want us to do as much uh, uh, utility scale stuff as possible, but it currently feels like we're obstructing rooftop solar too much. Thanks. So thanks, Sam. That, that's, that's, really, that's really helpful context. I noticed in your comments, in the survey, you 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 did what you did here. You kind of you kind of link recommendations two and three, and you're thinking that they 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 play onto each other, and they're they're important for each other too. And we should think about those collectively. Agree. Okay. I just want to make sure I was I was reading and interpreting right. No, it's a good interpretation. I'm not sure I noticed myself doing that in the <laughs> in the survey actually, but good point. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make a, a quick quick note to uh, to respond to the first half of your comment, Sam. Um, oh, sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, to just uh, if if you want to take a look at um, the wording that we have in there um, that the work group uh, developed uh, regarding um, equity and low income for rate design, it's on page twenty six, right at the bottom. So. Um, it, I can I can read it to everybody in case uh, <laughs> in case not everybody has the document right open in front of them. The recommendation that the group came up with says to achieve broader electrification, an equity and low income lens must remain a top priority. In addition to program efforts to reach low income customers, it's recommended that utilities study and offer electric or natural gas rates based on percent of income, rate subsidies for low income customers, or even net zero cost of electricity or natural gas for low income customers. Subsidized usage capping is one option based on the rating of the energy efficiency of the building. Two, those receiving subsidized rates would also be connected to an enhanced energy waste recovery program. Three, expand and improve energy assistance programs. Four, flexible payment programs. And five, rebates and carve outs for low income customers. Just wanted to highlight um, that that's what's in there and we are absolutely, and uh, so you know, take what you want of it and uh, it it's in your hands now. And and to that point, Commissioner, that that that's great. You pointed pointed that up, and and I noticed when I read that in in Illinois, where they just did a the, their massive clean energy bill, this was an issue where there was pretty good agreement that folks wanted a low income, some kind of consideration for low income, like like is in the recommendations, and like Sam was talking about. Um, but even there, where they were trying to come up with exact language, they couldn't figure out how to do it. And so they left it, you know, that's something between the commission and the utilities to, to kind of work through. So it's the same kind of process that 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 the recommendations were, were proposing here. So thanks for adding that, that's, that's very helpful. Um, Phil, you had a comment on what Sam was saying? Uh, just maybe the amplification. I, uh, when you, earlier when we had the, uh, we honed in on those two areas of disagreement. Um, I I don't see how utility scale solar and renewables and distributed energy are a binary choice. And yet, if I remember right, just in reading sort of the objections in the in the document in the recommendation document, it was uh, like there was sort of a disagreement with we should only do utility scale solar. Mm -hmm. And I. I didn't really understand what the argument for that was. I, I mean, I, you know, the economies of scale, but uh, yeah, there's some other considerations here, resiliency and so forth. Are those a binary choice? I'm assuming cost was probably the main reason, but is there anybody on the on the council that wants to weigh in on that? The that that wants to to talk about just in terms of utility scale, um, Brandon? Yeah, I, I can. I think start. I I don't think I I agree. There's not uh, a choice between the two. I think it's a question of um, some of the recommendations around behind the meter um, are seeking, at least in my view and in the view of others, to promote and and um, add cost add cost to all customers um, through the way we. Um, support distributed resources. It, it feels like some of those policies are supporting distributed for distributed sake, 
not necessarily what's the lowest cost manner in which to decarbonize. And I, I think what, what I would like to see is, is, you know, what I stand for and what I try to lead in our company is the utility as a force for good that can invest at scale in the clean energy resources and in the resiliency of the electric grid in a way that meets the call of the climate crisis and the challenge. And then to Sam's point, equitably distributes those costs amongst all based on, you know, a set of policy criteria about what people are either able to afford or what people, what percentage of the use of the system should, should attribute to that. So I do think the behind the meter and the rate design are, are fundamentally linked. Um, and, but I think when it comes to, you know, where should we be pushing policy because of the scale of the investment needed, both in the clean energy transformation and in the resiliency of the energy systems going forward, I do think we need to consider affordability, uh, both for those who can least afford it, as well as competitive electric rates, which are becoming another issue with, with respect to economic development, as well as access to natural gas rates. We need to think about all these things, which is why I, I, I pretty much wholly subscribe to a lot of these holistic um, energy system planning measures, because I think if we can, you know, unleash the investments required by utilities and then equitably distribute the cost to all customers and send price signals, I'm fully on board for sending proper price signals to customers and fully maximizing energy efficiency and demand response. Uh, we're going to meet this this challenge more cost effectively. Can I, can I, I, ask, that, a, that can I ask a follow up to you, Brendan? Yeah. So in in most places that are considering this, at least the ones that, that we've worked in, which is quite, quite a few now, um, they they look at different sizes, different scale of renewables. They look at utility scale. They look at small distributed. They look at larger distributed like community or they don't always look at it in terms of they all provide the exact same benefits. They don't try to justify it like that. I mean, it, they do in for terms of clean energy, adding more clean energy to the system. But the thought is that smaller distributed and, and community or larger distributed, however you want to define that, may also provide some additional benefits, may also provide some additional benefits within particular communities, especially. I mean, is there is, do we just look at it as a council do, and Eagle? Do we just look at it through the cost lens or is there room to look at it through some of the other lenses as well? Is that a fair question? Yeah, I, I think there's room. I guess I, um, I, I think we need to ask ourselves what is, um, what, what is the benefit that we're seeking? At times, I, I think Commissioner Paratic raised an important point about what does environmental justice mean in these circumstances? And I sometimes, you know, does it mean energy burden to Sam's point? Should the frame be not increasing or actually decreasing the amount that low income customers um, pay for their energy needs? Or does it mean low-income customers and other customers that have been disadvantaged should have access to certain types of technologies. Um, and so I think defining what we mean by by the benefits of resilience, you know, I, I think there's a lot, Douglas mentioned storage. There's a lot of potential in orchestrating distributed storage to improve both the grid benefits and individual customer reliability benefits. And so I, I definitely think there's promising ways um, to incorporate the location of certain assets right. to lower overall system costs. But I, I think it, it's just trying to get clear on what are those co-benefits. I, I get concerned about the overall costs of the transition, and I want to make sure that we're not inadvertently putting a target on climate related policies by by making the burden of the payment higher than it needs to be. So maybe I, I can be overly focused on that, but it's a it's a particularly the last few months, I am feeling a lot of pressure to maintain affordable, reliable and clean service for everybody in Michigan. And depending on and to your point, just a little variation of that depending on where something is located, it 
it might also have health impacts as well if you can locate so, storage as something as a like a, a, a uh, you know something that's there to improve voltage or something else may may take something else off the system that provides negative health impacts to a community too i mean just that's why i say there's lots of different you know lenses way to, to look through through this as well but thank you i appreciate you allowing me to push back a little bit so tanya yeah. you got your hand up I was also planning to push back, Doug. Oh, okay. Gently. Go for it. <laughs> so, just, I was actually going to raise as well the various benefits of distributed resources and access to new technology like demand response that I know that the utilities are deploying, but putting more control in customers' hands is, is a different paradigm. And I understand why it is going to be for a massive industry like ours slow to make that transition. But I think we're hampering the real opportunity to utilize technology by keeping third parties out, which is really what our current policies do, as was stated earlier. And so if we really do want to un unleash all of the potential of this new and clean technology, having only utilities at the helm of that transition, I don't think gets us um, the best outcome either. And so that there is value in making sure that there are both components as part of how we look at um, meeting those future needs. And then to the question about um, environmental justice or just communities who deserve better than they've gotten in the past, I think it's both. They do deserve affordable rates and they deserve to have clean technology that they have more local control over right in the neighborhoods where they reside. That is showing people respect by empowering them to make those decisions themselves. And it is a really important shift that I think we need to make in the way we think about how we provide services to those and to all communities, but particularly to those communities. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we've got just a few minutes left here um, for discussion, but I and I don't want to foreclose anybody discussing anything they they want to or anything we haven't brought up so far. But I know I noticed we haven't talked much about citing um, as one of the recommendations. We've kind of hit at least some on on all of the others, but we haven't really talked much about citing infrastructure. And I know um, from reading the the recommendations. You know, there's a lot there, both in terms of of distribution, uh, transmission, and different energy generation uh, siting. I didn't. I want to know if anybody had any particular comments on on that. Um, it's an issue everywhere, so it's it's not just a Michigan issue. It's it's absolutely everywhere. Um, and and again, another issue where it's very difficult to find consensus. But I didn't know if anybody had any thoughts that they wanted to, um, or maybe if I can call on Douglas, maybe to talk a little bit about some of the different thoughts that were in the the um, the work of the of the uh, uh, of this uh, uh, work group uh, on siting. I don't know, Douglas. Maybe you want to talk about that just a bit. Sure. So. The fundamental point is that as we sit right now, the ability to deploy renewables uh, appears to be the gating function on how fast we can decarbonize the power system and therefore how fast we can decarbonize the whole uh, economy. And I don't say this to pick on uh, consumers, but you know they currently have an IRP and in that IRP, they assumed that the rate at which they could build out solar is limited based on siting considerations. And that limit actually constrains the outcome of their modeling of what the best path is. So I, my point in bringing that up is not to argue about it, but to just say it's a real thing that is limiting uh, the rate of change. The we started out with wind and uh, there certainly has been some backlash. Wind is now much harder to cite than it was a decade ago. 
Um, I think it's probably the case that solar will be e always be easier to site than wind, but as we get to bigger solar, it becomes more contentious. Uh, so just to give you an idea of where things are going, I, there was a proposal publicly announced in Ohio about 10 days ago that would be one and a half gigawatts of solar in a single system covering 10,000 acres. So that is one path, you know, that siting could go and, and you can imagine it becomes very challenging to get land use policy approval of a proposal like that. Um, so the recommendations that were made really centered around how do we go about doing siting so that renewables are accepted by the host community. And some of that is for all of us to get smarter about where we want to put things. But also, how do we get, how do we make it ad, more advantageous to the community to become that host? So we did not offer firm and final answers to those issues, but rather said, in effect, there's a lot of work that needs to be done here. And right now, the work doesn't have a home. It's sort of scattered around utilities, government, state, local, various parts of state government, um, and developers. And we don't need to think we need to go to like a central authority on siting, but we need to do more work together, getting the information together, doing the analyses, providing transparent information to all of the participants. And out of that, hopefully we'll get some wisdom about siting and accelerate it. That's the essence of what our recommendations were. Thanks, Douglas. And that's on everything, right? Transmission, distribution, yeah. generation, on everything. Okay. Okay. Um, anybody else have any comments that they would like to talk about on siting? Otherwise, there's a couple of folks who haven't talked yet that I know submitted some comments on the survey that I'm, I'm going to call on and ask them just to say a couple words about the things that they said in there, because I think it's helpful for all the group to have it. But um, anybody want to talk citing? Anybody or anybody want to talk about the? I know we we talked a little bit about the um, rate design and and distributed um, uh, resources, but um, anybody want to weigh in on the gas issue itself too? Because that one, obviously, that's one where there is a more binary choice and. Within each, there are a whole set of either ways to go or or things to things to do. So, uh, yeah, Ron, do you want to do you want to say that what well, you put in the chat? Do you want to say that to the to the group? Because that's what what the example you cite is happening in a lot of places. So, yeah, I mean, I think it just reinforces the fact that I think that everybody said Elkhart, you know, uh, community in Indiana just just south of the border here of southwest Michigan, turned down 850 acres of solar nearly because it looked bad versus corn. Um, so if you think about if that's the hurdle and how do we get, so I think the policy changes is exciting, and defining that at a, at a state level then, you know, and, and, and working with the local communities and how to build good policy on how to do siting is key, but in the same token, it also reinforces that distributed may be effective in a transitional period as well. Um, because you don't, you know, that's it's more on a, a singular basis and how that can play a role because those approval processes may take years or, or decades. And, and yeah, the Ohio one, we have multiple experiences with that across years or decades worth of, of siting challenges that can happen uh, even with, with good policies in different areas across the country. So uh, it just reinforces the idea that that's going to be a, a massive challenge if if we think it's just going to be utility scale, I don't I don't think that's quite the answer. It's going to be a little bit more of the, all of the above. Yeah. Yep. And and with each each of them, each different kind brings its own particular siting challenges too. So yeah, very good. Let me um, let me ask Jim Harrison. Uh, I know you're on. You had a, a few comments that you put in the survey. Did you want to Did you want to talk to the group about um, about what you had there? Well, Doug, I knew this was coming. 
one way, one way or the other. See, I took one... a lot of time to prepare, Jim. So I thought <laughs> that's I what happens when you put your comments in the on the uh, survey, right? <laughs> um, so uh, just generally, though, I, I would like to just kind of have a, a couple of general reactions and comments. Please. Number one, picking up off of this citing um, issue. I mean, I think there are some really solid recommendations uh, about citing and looking. And if I was, if I'm you know, reading the uh, recommendations, the sub recommendations themselves, it looks at citing as in a holistic manner. Um, and I think that there is really um, opportunity, I think, to help communities and do stakeholder engagement communities and work with citing. Um, and this idea of, of utilizing um, um, mapping and, and that kind of thing, I think is really, really could be incredibly helpful. I'm not a fan of intimate domain, so I do agree with Douglas that, that um, you know, not having a central agency, but certainly uh, utilizing this and having this uh, maybe in incorporated into um, integrated resource planning as well, um, I think would be really you know, potentially helpful. I did have a nuance on citing a little bit, after, and it was based, my comments were, were based on uh, post citing and approval of projects. So one of the comments I had made, if there's an opportunity when projects are awarded to either look at, um, you know, understanding that MP, there is certain Supreme Court ruling on the role of government as a regulator or a proprietor, but um, and understand, you know, recognizing that the uh, commission is a is a regulator, so it's limited in what it can it can possibly do in approving projects, but is there a way in which uh, projects that use Michigan labor, Michigan union labor for construction all throughout the, the uh, uh, life of the project could be weighted or plussed up um, in, in looking at, um, you know, competitive bidding for projects and things like that. I had made that comment in. Um, in general, you know, when I, when I looked at all five, well, let me talk to the top four, um, these, I think, you know, distilling down you know, the 70 some comments. I mean, I, I give a lot of credit to our co-chairs and, and, you know, how difficult this was just to echo what everybody else had said. But, you know, I do think that there's opportunity and room for um, holistic integrated planning that addresses a number of these things. I think that's, a, in, you know, without getting into the weeds and then what, what people were talking about, but taking it at the very high level as something that we can do now. I mean, you know, there's a lot of uh, many open dockets right now that the commission has and looking at different um, opportunities, um, you know, for instance, even on the uh, on the storage right now. Um, so look and, and that, you know, there is an opportunity to think about how um, innovative rate design might work as well as behind the meter resources. I firmly understand and, and agree that those two are intimately connected and that behind the meter resource does affect who pays and how that is paid. Um, you know, my thoughts in relation to like Sam's very poignant comments about, about um, um, you know, the impact of rates on, on certain portions of our citizens in the state and ratepayers. you know, he's speaking to actually a very a much larger issue in the issue of income inequality of, in this country. Um, although I think we need to pay attention to that and how people are negatively affected on rates. Um, you know, rate design isn't going to fix isn't going to fix income inequality. I'm not speaking against you know looking at innovative rate design um, and and other um, opportunities for folks that are energy burdened, but the, the issue of income inequality is a much larger issue in this country that um, needs to be addressed as well. And thinking about decarbonizing, you know, early on some of my comments um, when looking at participating in this council was, you know, is there an opportunity? For Michigan to decarbonize its economy, change its economy, um, and use that as an economic driver and an economic um, driver for all citizens in the state so that no one's left behind. And I do think that that is um, an opportunity there. Um, I will say a comment about number five as well. Um, I do think and, and Doug, I think I made this comment previously in one of the pre in previous, I may have been under, in the building um, um, work, work, a subgroup a presentation to us uh, that Minnesota had looked at ways in which to decar uh, uh, pathways and decarbonizing its natural gas infrastructure. That was kind of hit, that actually was hit on. Um, I think it was under uh, sub bullet number eleven, under number five. Um, and I do think that that's an opportunity for Michigan to convene a group of stakeholders and really do a deep dive study on what decarbonizing looks like, as opposed to. 
uh, getting to the you know the other end of that and saying, well, what we need to do is is to decommission it. Let's look at what decarbonizing pathways look like, um, and then figure out what you know what policy needs to happen and, and what the regulatory process looks like in, in order to do that. Um, Douglas, I think had a point. I think is really important in relation to what the work group recommendations are. Um, and I'll kind of paraphrase that because I wrote this down as, you know, it's planning, it's iteration, but I also put testing and input analysis. It's, you know, we, what we have in front of us is a multi-decade process itself. Um, and there's some things that are currently going on, um, you know, under the purview of the commission and, and the state um, and the utilities. And I think there's opportunity to do some um, some additional project handling, particularly in behind, behind meter resources and innovative rate design. There's some opportunity in, in, in looking at certain um, you know, projects to understand what the impacts might be in relation to that. On number one, I did have a question on number one, because if I looked at um, looking at the at the, the sub bullets, um, it did, I think it did say that there were two sub recommendations that had full subgroup um, support. I think that was on page. Um, I would have been number eleven on the first recommendation. Um, I, I don't know if if any of our co-chairs can speak to that and what the two sub recommendations, which had full subcommittee report or subgroup, uh, excuse me, support. Douglas or commissioner. I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I can get back to you in the chat as we continue discussion in the next 10 minutes. Yeah. No problem. Nor, I, nor do I recall uh, okay. exactly which two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Yep. Um, Frank, I know you you made comments in the in the survey as well. Um, did you have anything that you wanted to you wanted to share with the group? Not particularly. Um, I, I, well, I want to thank you, Douglas, for I, one of my questions was about, you know, identifying actors for some of these. And, and that was, you know, right out of the gate, we heard that, you know, that that's uh, that's something that the committee also, you know, struggled with and came up with some some thoughts on. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I guess I'm I, I um, but when we're talking a little bit more about this distributed. Um, thoughts here. I guess some of my my arguments may be not necessarily for it, but at least to add a little nuance. Um, I know that um, um, sometimes when we get get um, we get participation, right? We can get some ownership in the system as these things become, you know, um, some of this behind the meter or distributed other distributed um, use and and I that's difficult or impossible to quantify, I think, but but also I think that the, you know if it allows for some political momentum um, a, as folks begin to internalize a little more of this as opposed to looking for some sort of outside agency to fix this for them and maybe get a little bit more you know bootstrapped in their thinking. Um, and also I was kind of wondering, I'm not sure if either of our co-chairs can can answer this sort of a question, but but did the, the work group kind of um, think about um, some of these issues from the perspective maybe of resiliency of, of the system or or maybe anti-fragile or whatever that we would you know look at that do those things does distributed um, generation in storage and some of these other issues in the you know embedded in these five recommendations are they is the resiliency of the system increased by having some of some of these distributed functions and factors and, and I don't I don't know that it does but uh, I was just wondering if the work group had thought from that perspective sure Douglas so, you unmuted first so I'll, I'll go yeah. to you. <laughs> sure so definitely the work groups discussed that our subgroup uh, on uh, distributed generation as well as one that focused on uh, the role of storage and uh, providing rely reliability and resilience. I, I would just say as a technical matter, um, speaking for myself, distributed resources can provide additional resilience, especially for the community as opposed to the grid, but they can also fail to, and it depends on the implementation. Um, 
which also depends on the rules. So it's something where if we want those that value from distributed resources, it has to be a deliberate intent uh, and something we build into how we do it. Okay. Thanks, Douglas. Frank, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. Uh, great discussion. Uh, covered a, a lot and, and a lot of ground and uh, gave the uh, I know gave uh, director and, and Eagle a, a lot to uh, a lot to think about as they look at these recommendations. So, uh, Director Clark, let me turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Doug. Uh, thank you to Douglas and Commissioner Paratek for all the work on this and to all of the assists uh, in terms of this pretty weighty work group. Um, that was just a fantastic conversation. Um, I don't know how others feel, but I really felt like it was excellent input given everybody's varied backgrounds and perspectives. Um, in order to get to the best possible outcome, the council discussion here and then the recommendations to Eagle need to reflect many diverse thoughts. Um, and I think that, you know, we've made, we've gotten a lot of things out on the table today, which I think is really, really helpful. Um, I'm struck um, by, I think it's an Abraham Lincoln quote, shoot, I feel like I should have looked it up, um, that says uh, the best way to understand the future is to enable it. And I think that, you know, that's an example um, to me of where I hope we're going. Now the trick becomes how do we connect our decarbonization goals to enabling that future that um, includes so many of the different uh, pillars that you all have uh, put forth in the course of the discussion. So, um, but I'm grateful, grateful for the conversation and for um, all the work that went into it from the worker perspective in order to inform it. So we're going to keep moving. Our next meeting is energy intensive industries and that'll be on Monday. Um, so after uh, the meeting today, you're going to receive the recommendations for energy intensive work group. We just wanted to hang on to it um, until we got through today. Um, and then on the 23rd, on November 23rd, we'll talk about natural working lands and forest products work group. Um, we are feeling like uh, we need another council meeting um, to give us more time to talk through work group uh, recommendations. And so you'll receive another availability poll. Um, to try to find some time uh, late in November. Um, as I've said before and up at the front, um, all materials will be on michigan.gov slash climate. Um, the um, recommendation materials will be up there shortly, hopefully um, tomorrow the day after. Um, so you'll be able to see that there as well for those that are um, not receiving that as council members. Um, we appreciate all comments. Uh, email comments can come uh, to the general box, which is eagle climate solutions at michigan.gov, and then direct comments to the work group, um, the energy uh, production, transmission, distribution, and storage work group, which Catherine says much faster and better than I do. I uh, can go to eagle um, energy production climate at michigan.gov. Um, so we're grateful for all that input that gets summarized and um, included in the discussions that we do. So um, again, just a huge thank you to the council members for your time, attention, and willingness to have the conversation today. Um, I think we've um, laid out a lot in front of us, but I do, I, I feel like I can um, see the discussion developing, and I'm grateful for that. So with that, we're right on time, 4.59. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.